We've been asked to talk about personalized medicine, and for me, really personalized medicine means putting patients back at the center of the healthcare delivery system and understanding what their needs and their healthcare preferences are. I recognize that there are multiple uh, definitions of personalized medicine, but this is the one that I tend to favor uh, because it really prioritizes patients and their needs. And the setting that I come from, McGill, we have been listening to patients for a long, long time. In fact, I love to throw this slide up because it really takes us back to the root of the importance of listening to patients. And I think that we have run with that in the last hundred years, and we have benefited immensely, and so have the patients that we care for in doing this. But the thing that we haven't done very well is listen to them around how to do this best how to deliver the care that they need when they need it, and in ways that make sense, especially in this time of such um, ongoing social and economic challenges. We need to do something differently. That's very clear, because the outcomes that we're seeing these days are a direct result of the system that is so entrenched in all of us. We have a system that thrives on roles and authority and hierarchy, and there is so much resistance to change. When you try to introduce change, the first thing that you that is so palpable is the resistance against the change, and yet we really need to change, and we need to fundamentally change, and that is why I am such um, an advocate and an enthusiast of the kind of messages that you hear from Diane on a regular basis. If we're going to do things differently and we're really going to bring meaningful change, then we're going to have to do it in a completely different manner. And business as usual no longer works. That's very, very clear. If we look at the conditions that are important in supporting collective impact, we see the the, the critical importance of bringing all the stakeholders to the table and getting everybody talking. The next feature, of course, is the shared measurement, understanding what to measure, how to go about measuring that, and that's what I'm going to really spend my time, and Sarah will spend her time talking about this afternoon, but there are other activities that are part of the collective impact movement, of course, that are every bit as important, making sure that the activities are, in fact, reinforcing and supporting the change that you're looking for, the value of communication, the importance of ongoing, continuous communication, and then you really do need that backbone of support because in the absence of tangible support and plans for how you're going to sustain any of the changes that you want to invoke, those changes are going to rapidly disappear. So coming back to measurement and what we're going to measure, well, it depends who you ask, really. If you ask, a, it was mentioned this morning that if you ask health economists on a question, you'll get a variety of different answers. Well, certainly what we try to do is bring different perspectives into the room about what really does matter and what should we be measuring. And boy, do we get diverse perspectives. And it really depends on who you ask. Now, some of these stakeholders have been well represented in the past, and probably the researchers, the best represented, because we weren't going to be able to continue to do the things that we wanted to do if we couldn't demonstrate that our theories or our interventions made a difference. So we learned how to measure the outcomes that would show our work or highlight what we were doing. In the best case scenario, we did that hand in hand with clinicians around the area of clinical research. Of course, in a whole other sphere were economists and poly policy makers who were looking at and evaluating very carefully the kinds of things that they were doing and, and looking at the outcomes associated, the administrators, but the, the group that we left away from the conversation have been the patients and the family members. And arguably, of everyone in the healthcare system, this is probably the most important stakeholder, or as one of my patients said to me, the ultimate <laughs> stakeholder in the healthcare system. And in the last 10 years or so, in Canada in particular, um, for a longer period of time, perhaps in the UK, less time in the US, but there has been a real focus on trying to understand the patient voice, learn from it, and use the knowledge and wisdom of patients to improve our healthcare delivery system. Now, the area that I work in is rheumatoid arthritis. And I think we may have been at the forefront in doing this for a long, long time, not because we're that prescient, but frankly, because rheumatoid arthritis was so challenging. There is no single measure that you can look to that tells you how the disease is doing or how the person is doing. And so historically what's happened is 
Clinicians have drawn on a variety of uh, sources of information, three primary sources. They look to laboratory results to try and get an indication of some of the acute phase reactants. They did their own clinical exams and used their own impressions and judgment, so uh, an examination of swollen and tender joints. And then they talked with patients, because only from patients could you learn about pain, could you learn about the impact, what people were able to do, what they weren't able to do, how they were doing overall, and how they felt their arthritis was doing. So it was a natural home to have a number of patient-centered outcomes. But one of the things that we really didn't do a great job of doing, and are working hard to try and change this, is to understand how the treatments that we offer are impacting patients, what the burdens are in addition to the benefits that can be expected. We now have treatments in the last 15 years that really have revolutionized the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Some of them are very expensive, upwards of $20,000 a year. Some people do very well with those, and others don't need that level of care, but we really haven't figured out how to best match patients with the treatment that's going to be optimal for them. The one thing that we have understood pretty consistently is that if you really want to understand how the treatments are working, you better be asking the patients and not the docs, because over time, the physician's perspective is, of course, important, but it's not nearly as helpful in helping you to understand how well the patient is doing and, more importantly, predicting where they're going to be five years from now. It's not just in rheumatoid arthritis that this occurs. This is a slide that shows the relationship between clinician ratings of symptoms and patient ratings. The clinician ratings are in the blue, and the patient ratings are in that brownish colored line. And what you see is that virtually across all of the symptoms, clinicians tend to underestimate the severity of the symptom and the impacts of the symptom on functioning. So, you know, we do our best as clinicians to try and understand and capture and work with what the patient tells us, but the reality is if we really want to understand what's happening, we need to be talking with patients, we need to be systematically collecting information from them, we need to be recording it and integrating it into all aspects of treatment planning and ongoing monitoring. This is just another slide that shows, too, if you want to know where patients are in terms of their function, and their function down the road at 24 months, the best person to talk to is the patient. Interestingly, fatigue ends up in both cancer and rheumatoid arthritis, and I suspect many other conditions. Fatigue ends up being one of the most disabling symptoms. So if you ask a rheumatoid arthritis patient, they'll say, I can live with the pain, I can manage that pain. But the fatigue is the end of me. That's the thing that prevents me from doing the things that I need to be doing. That's what really prevents me from being the mom I need to be and being able to go to work and work effectively. Do we ask about fatigue? Not routinely in our measures. Have we queried it? Only in the last few years. Do we do a good job of it? Probably not. Lots and lots of room for improvement. But as a result of patients telling us only 10 years ago, that fatigue is critically important to them, we've changed our strategy. And in fact, there's a real movement to now make fatigue part of the core set for looking at rheumatoid arthritis and the impact of treatments. If we're going to make our care patient-centered, then we need to make sure that we are capturing the patient voice and we're getting input from the patients on not only what to measure, but how to go about getting this information. And further, we need to understand their preferences and their needs around the healthcare delivery system. And so that brings us to the notion of a shared measurement system, a system that could capture that patient voice for us routinely and consistently across a variety of different care settings. With a shared measurement system, what we want to do is allow stakeholders to have a menu of options, really, that they can select from. And in an ideal sense, this would be a menu available from a series of web-based tools that could be downloaded and used to systematically collect information and interpreted in a predictable fashion so that we have outcomes that are able to harmonize across settings, across providers, across provinces. This is what Sarah and I undertook shortly, a few years ago, thinking it was a relatively small, important, but going to be a fairly simple 
thing to try and do because we had this amazing resource in the United States that was freely available that the NIH had invested over $200 million into. And so, and they were looking for partners. They wanted international partners. And in fact, they came to us looking for ways that they could partner. And we immediately saw the benefits of a national patient reported outcomes measurement system that could be freely available to all Canadian researchers, policymakers, administrators, patients for self-management. We could uh, use this information to better match treatments with patients, to coordinate care, to um, do some incredible uh, research in terms of having these data, rich data repositories that would have not only clinical symptoms, but also the patient perspective rigorously and systematically captured. And all of this information, of course, could be enormously valuable in helping us shape a national research agenda. It's fair to say that even in the most complex of systems, and certainly, as you have pointed out, healthcare is perhaps the most complex system there is, this tiny little goal that we had of bringing the shared measurement system to Canada proved to be more challenging than we had anticipated. And so what my colleague Sarah Ahmed is going to do is walk you through some of the challenges and uh, some of the opportunities that we have uncovered in this venture together. Thank you, Susan. So I'm just... I'm just going to build on uh, what Susan was saying, and I know we, we have some time crunches uh, to get through. So um, I'll talk to you a little bit about the meeting we had in November, and thanks to the support we had of several groups, some of our partners, uh, the ONF and the network of rehabilitation researchers at the CREER, who have been trying to figure out how do we integrate patient-reported outcomes into ongoing care, um, were also with us at the meeting. And like Susan mentioned, um, um, like she mentioned, that one of the, the initiations of this initiative was our discussions with our U.S. partner, which is the Promise Group, the Patient Reported Outcome Measurement Information System, where um, uh, our U.S. partners came and said, would you like to have a Canada PRO uh, extension? And of course, there are several Canadian researchers right now who are using the Promise system. But we did identify some challenges uh, to being able to directly use the infrastructure that is there. And so we started having some more informal uh, discussions about what those challenges are. And then at the meeting, uh, brought the researchers together to discuss them in more detail. And these included things like, where does the data sit? Is it okay if, you know, we're collecting data on, in Canada, but it's sitting in a, in a U.S. server somewhere? Um, things like support. So within Promise, there's a scientific development arm, but also a technical arm that maintains the platform through which these patient-reported outcomes are administered, and access to support while it's readily available and, and free, not necessarily always accessible and timely. If we're talking about research, for example, or application in clinical care where immediate uh, assistance is needed. and. <clears throat> Also, there is the issues of language and cultural adaptability. So uh, within the promise, there are uh, a large amount of items that are available to measure several domains that would be of interest of asking patients. Some of the ones that uh, Susan talked about earlier, like fatigue, pain, me um, mental health, physical health, etc. cetera. Um, but many of them weren't translated into French. And then there's a whole aspect of cultural adaptation that's important. So we had some discussions around uh, that uh, during our meeting. And our main goal was to look at all of the issues and deliberate around priorities for if we were to have a Canada PRO network, um, what would be the collective needs, uh, what relationships and partnerships would be needed to, to initiate this and sustain such a partnership, and what is a feasible and realistic action plan. So. As we started having discussions, things became much more complex than we had initially anticipated, and it was clear that we can't do it all at once and that um, there'd have to be a clear plan of, of how to progress. So throughout that day, we brought experts, and, and there are several um, Canadian researchers who are pioneers in the development of health outcome measures um, throughout the years. And so we brought them to come and talk to us historically about how outcome measure has developed and standardized, and whether, where, in which contests is it regularly uh, applied. And again, the answer there was uh, not really on a wide scale. 
brought the Promise uh, Network and group and other uh, groups who are currently uh, looking at developing a shared measurement system within their networks to talk about some of the successes and challenges. And we had discussions around those and used a, a process of democracy to gain consensus and SWOT analysis to establish priorities. Now, this is it in a nutshot, in a, in a, in a snapshot of what uh, the priorities identified uh, were. In each of those circles, like, we probably have uh, 10 action items that fall under them. And I'll start with evaluating needs. So as Susan mentioned, the answer to what matters and what should we measure will vary tremendously depending on who you ask. And so we recognize the need uh, to do a use case analysis of all the stakeholders involved, from patients to caregivers, uh, clinicians, decision makers, administrators, et cetera, to say, what, what value do you see in, in standardizing and routinely collecting patient reported outcomes? And how would you use these measures in decision making? And recognize that to get buy-in into integrating systems to regularly collect these measures and buy-in for patients to take the time to answer the, the list, tons of questions that we would like to ask them, that they would have to recognize uh, a return on that time and effort. Um, the science of patient reported outcomes has advanced tremendously over the past decade. Uh, the PROMISE system that we talked about is based on using advanced psychometric approaches and, and item response theory. I won't bore you with the, the details of how that works, but it, it uses uh, different um, statistical models to allow us to administer a smaller number of items to get just as precise uh, an estimate of outcomes. And the science behind that is continuously uh, developing and addressing uh, different gaps that are identified along the way, such as scoring of these items, um, developing new item banks or, or measures to address domains that we still don't have measures for, et cetera. Um, implementation. This is where we identified huge gaps where even in areas where standardized, efficient clinical uh, measures with good clinical utility exist, they're still not being implemented regularly in certain patient populations. And so looking at the challenges to implementation from all the way from training uh, clinicians and uh, policy and decision makers to how to use these measures and interpret them to the technological infrastructure that would be needed to make it efficient to not only collect items and data, but also to uh, report back the data to stakeholders so that they could use it within their decision making and harmonizing, making sure that systems that collect PROs cannot talk to other systems and be combined with clinical data or administrative data that are needed to provide the full picture. And also building the evidence base that actually using these measures does improve outcomes and improve care. And at the bottom of all of that, to support this, uh, there would need to be um, partnerships built, not only with provincial and national organizations, but also with industry to help sustain this, um, thinking about also the uh, infrastructure needed. And then there, there are whole other areas of privacy and security around data sharing. So to take this, continue the discussion and engage the partners that were there with our, at our meeting uh, that represented a variety of different stakeholder groups, um, we're putting together a series of uh, papers, which we hope would not just end up being a, a series of academic papers that sits in a journal and, and doesn't go anywhere, but hopefully will help solidify the action plan and get the members that are working in each of these working groups to look at sustainability of the PRO initiative all the way to uh, the user needs and methodological challenges that they'll continue to be engaged and that we can grow um, the network. And it's been great to hear the discussions this morning about how to work with uh, industry and and to sustain uh, partnerships and we've we thought about it and we've been in discussion with several groups but as some of the challenges that are were mentioned today that uh, because of there are tend to be turnover in government and in different groups that's engaging the same individuals over time is a, is a challenge and so we continue uh, to work on that and look to forward to having discussions with you um, and, and ideas and engagement for those who are interested and this is just our website uh, where we continue up to update different activities that are going on but also link in with our national and international partners of what's going on in their networks as well thank you